questions, please call me. And if you have any ideas for outreach in the neighborhood, would you please call me and share your ideas? That's what we're looking for now. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Heather, for leading that charge. Seeds of Faith Community Garden. Did I get that right? Yes. Fantastic. That's awesome. What's in a name? Names matter to the Lord. And that just sounds appropriate to me. Awesome. Let's pray and uh, prepare our hearts for what the Lord would have through the Word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your great love for us. And part of that is demonstrated through the inspired word that you've given us. A love letter of love letters. Instructions, guidance, helpful tips to say the least. Wisdom. Lord, uh, give us ears to hear this morning. And then courage to act upon what you challenge each heart to do. Lord, I pray that you would continue to build your kingdom here and that you would use each one of us and find us multiple in your hands. God, I pray a special blessing upon Pastor Pat as he delivers the word. Father, bring clarity for your glory and our joy. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. That's a great report on the community garden. I was over there yesterday morning and took that, that shift. It really is just a matter of just sitting there and talking to people if they go by and letting them know what we're doing and uh, invite them to come to church and that kind of a thing. So if you can help with that, uh, there are certain times of the week that Heather would like to have some folks there. We'd love to have you help be a part of that. It's a great opportunity to do that. God is doing good things, isn't he? Yeah. Well, take your Bibles this morning and turn with me, if you will, to... Uh, the book of Acts, chapter 13, we left off a couple weeks ago when I taught out of this chapter, um, and so we're coming back with a, another look as we take a deeper look at the subject of continuing in grace. Beginning in verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word today. What an honor it is for us to gather together in your name as your church, that you may speak to us by your spirit and by your word. We thank you for all that you do in our lives and helping us through each and everything that we face as our journey continues until that day when we stand before you in your presence tangibly. We ask that you bless our hearts with your understanding of the word today, let it find lodging in our spirit, that we might walk with you in victory and success. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Paul's custom was to go into the synagogues and, uh, and teach the gospel on the Sabbath day. There was a crowd of people that was interested in religious things, and they had an open forum in which they were allowed that to take place. The Gentiles were overhearing what was going on, and they begged that they might hear that same word the next week. I like that kind of hunger in people. I believe there's still hunger in people's hearts out there today. I know there's a lot of stuff going on that's very discouraging, and a lot of things that are not uh, conducive to uh, you know, the Christian way of life. But I tell you what, there are people out there that want to know God, and we are a witness for Him. It is up to us to teach the gospel and bring the gospel to them. And here was a whole city of Gentiles that wanted to know God. They wanted that word taught to them. Paul and Barnabas, speaking to the, the Jews and, and the proselytes that followed, persuading them to continue in the grace of God. We talked two weeks ago when I taught about that. We're going to pick up 
uh, without going into review of what I taught two weeks ago, I want to talk about what it means to continue in grace. And there are a few things that we're going to look at this morning. And the first one, coming from 2 Peter. If you take your Bible and go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, give us a real strong hint of what it means to continue in grace and how we do that. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. God has given to us great and precious promises that when we take those promises and believe those promises, put faith in the promises of God, he begins to work in our lives. God requires of us faith in him, in his word, in his promises. And as we, as we do that, we become partakers of a divine nature. We all have an old nature, our sinful nature, which remains with us until we are glorified and up into heaven with Christ. Until that time, we have a, a nature that still remains here that causes us to, you know, to, to be tempted at times and maybe not do the right things all the time. But there's this divine nature that has come into us when we were born again in the Spirit of God. God's Spirit came into our life and we became new creations in Christ Jesus. Old things pass away, all things become new. We no longer look at things in the same way. But along with that came power and faith that God gave us to believe him for things. I, I think one of the greatest promises is from Hebrews chapter 11, 6, where it says, uh, For they that come to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, I want to be rewarded by God, so I want to diligently seek Him, don't you? Amen. Yeah, we really do. We want to be seekers of God, God seekers. I want to know Him better tomorrow than I do today. And as we do that, we, we begin to understand God, and His grace begins to become more real to us. Later in this epistle, Peter would make the statement, he said, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, in 2 Peter 3, 18. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. To grow in grace means to mature as a Christian. We know that we're saved by grace through faith. Faith in what? Faith in Christ and in his grace, in his goodness. The gospel message really is this, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If we believe that, if we, that God is that kind of a God, that he, he is gracious, that he, through his son Jesus Christ, has provided for us all of our sins to be forgiven, and that we can live with him for eternity, we just need to believe that. Many people believe that God is an angry God, that God's out to get them, that he's looking for every pro every, 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 everything they do wrong and try to, 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 to put them in hell rather than bring them to heaven, and that's just not the case. He's a loving and a gracious God. And when we believe in that loving and gracious God, we, we naturally want to serve him. We, we want to know him better. We know that grace is a blessing that we don't deserve. We know that it's God's grace that justifies us, makes us just as if we never sinned. That's, that's a, a work of God's grace. It sanctifies us. When we come to Christ, he immediately sets us apart and seals us with his Holy Spirit. We become his precious children. That's a work of grace. That sanctification has a second 
aspect to it in which we, we work out our salvation. We become more like Jesus, being conformed to the image of Christ, learning what it's like to be like Christ, and then, and then applying that to our lives. And by His strength and His grace, we can do that. We become more and more holy. To grow in grace doesn't mean gaining more grace from God because grace is infinite. It doesn't change. His grace is always there. It's that we begin to understand it more, walk in the benefits of it more as we grow in grace. We do this by being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's just reasonable to accept that. If we understand what Jesus has done for us and we cannot save ourselves, it's only the reasonable thing to want to, to serve him with our lives. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As we take in the word of God, as we become students of the word and living in a, in a relationship with him and in fellowship with one another, we, we begin to be transformed. Our old way of thinking begins to diminish and his way of thinking in our hearts and our lives becomes more and more evident. That's grace. We understand through grace, by faith in this grace, that, that when we deserve to be punished or abandoned from God, instead, he offers us forgiveness. And that if we accept by faith his mercy and his forgiveness, that's grace. When we realize that we can't face the circumstances the events that we're going through, as we all do it sometimes in our lives, go through difficult things and it just seems overwhelming. You can't hardly do it. That's when you come to the end of yourself and you put your trust in him and he begins to give you a supernatural strength to be able to continue when you feel like there's no way you can continue, that you can't handle the situation. He shows up with his grace at a divine empowerment. When we lack wisdom, we ask of him and he gives it liberally, James said in his epistle. When we're not so lovable, when we're having a bad day, or maybe a bad week, I've known people have had bad years. But guess what? God's grace and his mercy are still there for them. That's, that, that's, that's what grace offers to us. When we fall short, Sin, he offers us forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we need strength, he gives us his power and perseverance. When we believe in Jesus and develop a relationship with him, we receive grace right then. Grace means that he has given us the gift of his forgiveness, the gift of his kindness, the gift of his favor, the gift of his, his relationship as a father to us. We didn't work for any of that. He just gives it to us because we believe in him. We can, we can live confidently knowing that we have received the favor of God because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. There is no limit to God's grace for us. If we truly understand what we have received, it'll be easier for us to give grace to others. We're to see others as Jesus sees us. Made in his image, and more valuable than anything else in this world. That's how Jesus sees us. And that's how he sees everyone in this world. And we have the opportunity to grow in grace when we are sometimes hurt by others. Or if we face a tragic loss, 
God's divine empowerment is there to get in and to help us. As we grow in grace, it becomes easier to forgive people. I've pretty much come to a place in my life, you know, years ago, that I can forgive people real easy. Because growing in grace helped help me to understand how much he's forgiven me. So I'm able to forgive others much easier. Now that doesn't mean that I excuse what they did wrong. And it doesn't mean I have to like what they're doing now if they've never repented. But as far as it goes for me, I will be at peace with them and I will forgive them and not hold it against them. Through grace, he can help us heal from the hurts and wounds that we have. The more we let him into our hurts, the more he can help us grow in grace. It's not just a one-time event, though. It's a process. It's what we do. It's how we grow. It affects our mind and our will and our emotions also. I call your attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. It says, concerning the Apostle Paul, he's writing here about himself, the experience he's having. He said, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that he might depart from me, or that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. There's a lot of debate over what the thorn in the flesh was. Some believe that it was a physical infirmity, perhaps his eyes. He didn't have good eyesight, at least not for a while. We know that. But I think it was exactly what it says here, a messenger of Satan. That word messenger, angelos, means that it was an angel from Satan. I believe it was a demonic spirit that followed Paul everywhere he went and stirred up in the cities that he went to the hearts of people to persecute him. That's just my opinion. You don't have to believe that. No one knows. So we would be arguing from silence to try to nail that down. It's not a different view. It doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, he sought three times asking the Lord to deliver him from this, that this thing would depart from him. And the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient. You're going to face this thing, but you're going to find that my grace will uphold you in the midst of it. My grace will be there to strengthen you when you seem the weakest. In fact, Paul said, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When we come to a place and we're facing something that is just unbearable, if we just come to ourselves and say, I can't face this, and I put all my trust in the Lord, I can't change this. Sometimes it might be a person in your life who needs help and they don't want the help right now. You can't do anything for them. And so you just turn it over to the Lord and say, Lord, I can't change them, but I'm asking you to change them. I'm putting my trust in you to change them. We have strength to persevere that is guaranteed for us through the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, for you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses 
in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. A witness is someone who sees something, knows something, and tells something. When we go through difficult times, we get to witness Jesus working in our hearts and our lives, giving us the strength that seems unbelievable, that we can't even imagine that we could have it. We should be devastated, and instead, he's strengthening us and helping us. He's giving us wisdom and direction. We know that we're experiencing God's grace when we have ignited in us and in our hearts the confidence that he will work all things together for good. So many times I've been through things and I've helped people through things that just don't seem rational. It's like, why am I going through this? How did this happen? It isn't fair. But when I call upon his grace, it helps me to understand that though this situation is no fun going through, it's not fair. But I know that all things will work together for you. He will take this mess and he will turn it into something good if I will stay in love with him. Romans 8, 28 says, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. That's us. We know that we're experiencing his grace when we sense his presence at work in our hearts and our lives. And we know that we're experiencing his grace when our, our focus shifts from the problem to Jesus, to God. My focus is on him, not always on the problem. When we walk in grace, we become equipped to be able to express and show grace to others. A lot of people think, well, I need to be really healed up. I really need to be, you know, on top of my game. My, my bank account needs to be really big for me to be gracious to other people. But once I get all that together, then I'll, I'll give, then I'll help, then I'll do the right thing, then I'll tithe or whatever it is. Once everything is in place, things are probably not going to get in place for you with that attitude. God wants to show us that he is the one who's going to give us the strength right in the midst of the problem, right in the midst of the poverty, right in the midst of the, the need for healing, he is going to be there to get us through. It's not when we get it all together that we can be gracious to others. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse one begins and says, moreover brethren, we make known to you, now he's writing to the Corinthians, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. In other words, these folks were going through in Macedonia great affliction, great trials. Poverty. And out of that, they couldn't wait to give to the suffering saints that were in Jerusalem. He says, For I bear, verse 3, witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. He's calling the Corinthians to be gracious 
like the Macedonians are. Be gracious. You folks have everything. You're really good people. You know, in a lot of ways they were, in some ways they weren't, but they needed to be corrected. But he said, because of who you are, realize that the Macedonians who were experiencing great affliction God, were gracious. We want you to be gracious also. We need to be gracious with one another. We need to, to show that same mercy and forgiveness, that same favor to one another. That's continuing in grace. That's one of the aspects of it. I believe that in the process of, of, of reciprocity, that means that what we give will come back to us. And I believe that as we're gracious to others, we can expect more grace to be poured out upon us. And I don't know about you, but I want as much grace as I can get. In fact, I'll just be honest with you, I need as much grace as I can get. I need that mercy. So that's how I want to treat one another. There's another aspect of continuing grace that we we have to take a look at. Romans chapter 5, verse 20, says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. In other words, the law showed people their offenses and made it clear to them where they were missing the mark. But where sin abounded, Grace abounded much more. The great theologian, R.C. Sproul, said that we think of grace in the New Testament as amazing grace. And it is. All of that. He said, but a lot of people think in the Old Testament, they think that it was just judgment and a very critical God. But if you really read the Old Testament and see all the times they messed up, you see that they had, as he called it, astonishing grace. That God would continue to deliver them and bring them out when they continued to mess up. Where sin abounded, grace did more abound. God has always been gracious. Now, in Romans 6, verse 1 and 2, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. One translation says, Perish the thought. Don't even consider it. How shall we who die in this sin live any longer? in it. We are not to continue in sin. There are those who believe that we're kind of doing God a favor by showing how gracious he is by being really big sinners down here. That's just not in line with the word of God at all. When we understand the grace of God and what he has done for us and what Jesus did for us and how he was raised from the dead and there's an empty tomb there, that should cause us to want to serve him out of appreciation. I've always said you cannot legislate holiness. Some churches try to do that. They've got all kinds of rules and regulations. And then if you do all these things, then you're holy. The truth is, is that most people that don't measure up and those that do become so filled with pride that they look down their nose at everybody else and it just causes a lot of, you know, grace has been removed and they end up fighting and devouring one another, just says in Galatians. But when we're gracious to one another, 
when we understand what Jesus has done for us, that we have been born again of the Spirit of God, that the old man has been done away. And how we're to treat that old nature is to put it off and put on the new nature, as it says in Colossians. When I was born again at this altar on March 28, 1976, Pat Lagan died. He was put to death before I walked out those doors. I had made a deep commitment to God that day. I had thought about it for years. This wasn't some snap decision I made. I had been witness to for over six years by one of my best friends. I've seen his life change through Christ, but I was not ready. I ran from it. I knew about it. I knew Jesus saved. I knew all of that, but I, I was not ready until I finally came here and heard the gospel in a very powerful way, preached by the pastor of this church, began to have an effect upon me. About my third week back when I went to the altar and gave my heart to the Lord. And I remember before I left the altar, I prayed with the man who prayed with me. And when we were done, I stayed there and I prayed for a couple minutes more. I said, Lord, I don't understand all of what, what, what I just prayed here, but I want to be a real Christian. I want, I want to be what you want me to be. And we've all done that if we've been born again of the Spirit of God. The idea is that those who are, are not in Christ live under the rule of sin. I once lived under the rule of sin. You did too. It just it was just what we did. And they can't avoid sinning. It's like the only option they've got. But Christ's death on the cross paid for our sins and broke sin's rule over our lives. I'm not going to take the time this morning, but if you'll read the rest of the sixth chapter of Romans, you'll see that it says that sin shall not have dominion over us. We do not have to continue in sin, and we shouldn't. We have the power in Christ through his grace, his divine favor, to stop sin. Now, we have not lost our desire to sin. And oh, how I wish we would have. But the desire is still there. But the power to say no every day is there also. And the more we do that, the greater we get to know Christ and his power and his strength in our lives as we see him working. In Titus, if you want to turn there, chapter 2, verse 11. It was a life-changing verse for me when I heard it. I heard it right here in this church a few weeks after I got saved. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now that means the cross. It's available to everyone. I believe that the cross, that little symbol, the cross, is probably the most popular symbol in the world today. It's everywhere. <laughs> People that don't even know Christ wear crosses around their neck, they don't even know what they're doing. It's appeared to everyone. But here's the thing. It goes on and says, now watch this. It's appeared to everyone. But verse 12 says, teaching us. That's us believers. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. God says if you will deny sin, if you will deny ungodliness, if you'll deny the worldly lusts out there, he'll give you the power to overcome it. The problem is, is that too many Christians want to meddle in it, kind of do both, you know. I want to be a Christian, but I want to meddle in this. That's where we get into real trouble. 
We don't have to. Sin shall not have dominion over us. We have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to overcome sin. And then verse 13 says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. When our focus is on Jesus, our focus is on eternity. Our focus is on the fact that Jesus could come back to this earth today to receive his church unto himself and catch us away. When I believe that, when I live in the truth of that, the reality of that, I experience his grace in a way in which I'm able to overcome the evil things that my flesh may still want to do. How is that done? Continuing grace, that's what we're talking about. How is it done? Galatians chapter 2. Verse 20 and 21 talks about what I call the exchanged life. We exchange our life for his life, our unrighteousness for his righteousness, our powerlessness for his power. And Galatians 2 20 and 21 puts it this way I've been crucified with Christ. Remember, died to sin. It is no longer I who live. Remember, Pat Lagan died. No longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. I thank him for his grace. When temptation comes to your door, send Jesus. When sickness comes to your door, send Jesus. He lives in you. When anger comes to your door, send Jesus. Let him answer the door. Don't send yourself. Send him. He lives in you. Say, Jesus, I need you to handle this situation because I know if I try to do it myself, I'm going to mess it up just like I always have. So I need you, Jesus, to do this. And his grace comes into that situation and gives us victory where we would normally have defeat. Now, I'm going to close with finishing up Acts chapter 13. We'll pick it up in verse 44 as we close this service out. It says, On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Remember, the Gentiles the week before on the Sabbath didn't get to hear it all, and they asked to be taught the word, like Paul and Barnabas have been teaching the Jews. They were crying out, we want to hear, almost the whole city comes out to hear Paul and Barnabas share the gospel. It's interesting that it says on the next Sabbath, okay? Sometimes people get frustrated because maybe our church isn't doing enough stuff or whatever, and they got turned their fellowship into a squirrel cage of religious activity. I know we need to be busy serving God, but the early church did pretty good. In fact, the Bible tells us later in the book of Acts that they turned the world upside down, and all they did was meet on the Sabbath day and publicly and from house to house. They simply focused on the basic, simple things, and God ignited that church with his power, his strength, salvation, healing, and all kinds of deliverance because they just were doing what Jesus said to do. Continues to fasting the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread, fellowship, and in prayers. That's what the church does. If we focus on those things, God can do a lot of things. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have potlucks, because Lord knows we have to have potlucks, right? Amen. I just thought I was going to get a bigger amen than that. 
No, we need to have fun. We need to laugh together. We need to have things and we need to be reaching out to the community and all those kinds of things. But oftentimes, we end up kind of just doing things for things' sake. And to the exclusion of these basic things that God uses to build real disciples. Verse 45 says, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicted and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Understand that when the church is doing what it's supposed to be doing, it's going to have resistance. It's going to have persecution. It's going to have those who will come against it. Satan will sow people into churches just to cause trouble. One of my prayers every day for this church, almost every day, is Lord, keep us from wolves and from evildoers. Believe me, I've had churches that have plenty of evildoers in them in the past, and it's no fun, okay? The place might be packed, and it's really exciting. And the people come, and they say, oh, look at how we're growing, it's wonderful, but I've got to deal with <laughs> some of these things are not fun to deal with. We don't have any of that right now. I'm glad for that. I'd rather have peace in the house of God. And so these people that should have been believers and should have been following and should have been grateful for the gospel weren't. They were causing trouble. Verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. What a word. We brought it to you like we were supposed to. We came to our Judea. We, we came and we preached to you, Jews first, but you rejected it. And so we're going to the Gentiles. Verse 47 says, For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. Appointed to eternal life. What does that mean? I'm just going to real quickly give you my point of view on that. Is this. God has appointed all to eternal life who believe in Jesus Christ. I don't believe God has appointed some to go to heaven and some to go to hell. There are some that there's nothing they're going to do in this world that ever going to get them out of going to hell. I don't believe that God ever done that he has given his gospel, and all who believe in him are appointed to go to eternal life with him. Verse 49, And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region, but the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women, and the chief men of the city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. The Jews have missed out here. They have rejected the word. And there are people that we're going to run into who are just rejectors of the word. They're not going to take it. And that's okay. Pray for them, but from such, turn away. And that's what they did here. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your power. Stand with me because we're going to worship the Lord together this morning. Let him touch your heart. Just worship him this morning. Let's just stand together and let's just worship him this morning. Thank you. When this song is over and we're done, I'm going to ask, I'd like to ask Jeff Demo if he would come and close us in prayer. Jeff, would you do that for me?